off. Introduce her. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Uh, we're um, we're all going to start up now, and uh, the last half of this program, we're going to cover protecting your property. Okay. There are two ways to protect your property. You could try and harden it, which we're going to talk about. But no matter how well you harden it, there's always going to be some damage. So that's why you have insurance. So we have Rob with State Farm, and he's going to talk about hurricane insurance. And we're, I'm going to talk a little about, about, about flood insurance, because people confuse the two. And we're sort of going to like have a, like a quick, informal chat, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so, um, a lot of people ask, which policy covers me? So, there's hurricane insurance and there's flood insurance. So, Rob, you want to talk about hurricane insurance, uh, the part of it? Or? I'm Rob Shimabuko, I'm a State Farm agent, and just here to talk um, about the wonderful world of insurance and just kind of high level, kind of go over some things. But um, hurricane insurance is basically wind related damage, and it's uh, damage that results from wind uh, if there's a declared hurricane warning or watch. So, we learned about that earlier tonight. Uh, but thinking also, water damage when wind creates a hole in the wall or causes damage to your roof. And so um, it's really important that we understand what our hurricane coverage is. Um, my goal tonight is not to sell you any insurance, but basically just tell you um, there's some important aspects to the hurricane uh, policy that maybe you should, you should review with your agent, uh, if you have an agent, um, and also um, just some things you can do to plan for the future ahead of time uh, so in the event that something happens, um, we can resolve your claims faster um, and get you more money in your policy and get you more coverage based upon what you have for coverage. So um, actually one of the things that um, is most important is you actually do a home inventory. And so there, I have just some, some manual home inventories here you can pick up. Um, and that's basically like, it'll help you get a good idea of number one, how much personal property insurance you need. And also number two, it'll give you an idea of what you have, uh, year, make, model, serial numbers, um, of all the items in your house. Has anybody ever, here ever suffered a loss to your house? Any fire, burglary, theft, <laughs> flood, right? So what's the first thing that happens after you file a claim, or, or what's the first thing that happens? Investigation, right? The claim adjuster is going to come out, maybe, maybe police are going to come out and they're going to say, what's missing? What did you lose? And you're under stress emotionally, right? Somebody came through your house, maybe you had a fire in your house. How are you going to remember all the things that you had and how much it's worth? And so we re strongly recommend you do an inventory checklist. Um, it doesn't matter how you do it, just do something, right? So um, whether it's taking pictures, whether it's walking through your home with a video camera, whether it's a manual checklist, an Excel document, it doesn't matter what you do, just do something. Should they do that before hurricane season? Like you should do that now, right? <laughs> yes, okay, if they haven't done it already. If you haven't done it already. But you know, I talk to a lot of homeowners because that's one of the primary things that I, I do and um, we tell everybody to do it and maybe, you know, 10% of the people out there actually do something. So um, you want to do it ahead of time before something happens. Because the worst time to have to think about everything that you have is when you actually need to file a claim. And how about, do they need pictures of the items that they have? So pictures are not required, but it definitely will help. So the more information you have, the better. So receipts, pictures, um, serial numbers, um, anything to do to identify property that you have in terms of value. Just because you have $100,000 in personal property doesn't mean that we're going to write you a check or any insurance company is not going to just write you a check for $100,000 because you had a loss. They're going to ask you, what did you lose? I need you to itemize it. And if, you, if you're not able to do that, then you know, that will delay the process for you getting paid out quicker. And um, why don't we so there's really, uh, we mentioned like hurricane insurance or flood insurance, and there's also like regular homeowner's insurance, right? So 
maybe why don't you just cover the difference between homeowners, like for fire and death, versus hurricane insurance. And I'll cover the flood insurance part. Why don't you do that? So if you have a hazard hazard insurance policy, you know that's going to cover you for most of most of your 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 theft. It's going to cover you for wind damage, not hurricane. Um, it'll cover you for fire. Um, hurricane coverage is going to kick in when the the when there's a declared hurricane warning or watch. And prior to a storm coming to hit us, um, there's going to be something called a moratorium issued. And during that time when there's a moratorium, there's no new insurance policies that can be written. So if, you, if you're not carrying hurricane insurance and there's a storm coming, you come on, what am I going to do? I'm going to call up my insurance agent and say, hey, I want to add hurricane insurance. And they're going to say, well, it's not available because we're in a moratorium. And, and that's because insurance is to protect from the unknown, not the known. Right? Now what's the moratorium typically for like a hurricane insurance policy? Because I know for, for the flood, it's 30 days. You want to try and get a, a, a new flood insurance policy under the flood insurance program, you have to wait 30 days. But do you think it's that, that's a good question. I think it's, it's company specific. Yes. Uh, but generally, it could be 48 hours to 72 hours. It could be longer. It could be a, you know, even, mo even more days before the storm actually hits, um, that there's no new policies um, being issued. Um, that also brings up a good point um, where from the moment there's a declared hurricane warning or watch, that's when, that's when your hazard policy, the wind coverage stops, and that's when your hurricane coverage kicks in. From the downgrade of that storm, for up to 72 hours thereafter, the hurricane coverage is still in effect. So that's why in 2014, when Hurricane Isel came and hit us, you know, um, I think it was like a Wednesday night, Hurricane Isel was upgraded to a Category 1, and then it was downgraded Thursday morning, and then it hit us thereafter. And everyone's like, well, it hit us as a tropical storm. It should, it should not fall under my hurricane coverage. It should fall under my homeowner's policy. Well, the way that the, the insurance contracts are written for up to 72 hours thereafter, the downgrade, that's still defined as hurricane coverage under your hurricane policy. And that's pretty standard across, across Hawaii. So people were, were concerned about that. And, and, and so if, if the damage from his cell resulted in hurricane damage that was covered under the hurricane policy, your minimum deductible is 2% of your structure. So a lot of the damage was fence or it was a tree that fell on your house. And, and so it was under deductible and therefore insurance companies were declining coverage because not because there was no coverage, but because it was under deductible in a lot of cases. Or the people didn't have hurricane coverage, they had only homeowners coverage. But the insurance companies were looking at it as hurricane. Do you have a question, Brad? Is that also standard across the line? Is that also standard for the different insurance companies? Yes, so, so as far as I know, I can't speak for every company out there, but as far as I know, the, the minimum deductible, is a, it's a percentage deductible, and it's a percentage, it's 2% of your structure coverage is the lowest amount of deductible you can get for hurricane coverage. So I'm talking specifically hurricane coverage. Yeah, it's different. So what we're trying to get across with this slide is there are three different kinds of coverage. There's like your coverage for your homeowner, like fire, theft, robbery. Then you may have hurricane insurance. Your, mortgage, your bank may require you to have hurricane insurance, and that's going to kick in for a hurricane. And then if you're in a flood zone, you may have flood insurance. So the question is there's damage in your house. What is, which insurance covers what? So you, you, generally the, the, the idea is if the water's coming from the bottom up, it's your flood insurance is, is supposed to cover it. And if it's coming from the top down, it's your hurricane insurance, okay? So the last slide we wanted to just go over is, um, oh wait. Okay, so Rob, why don't you talk about um, when you, when you get insurance, you know, people think, do I get insurance for market value or replacement value of the house? So, Rob, do you want to discuss sure. that? Yeah. I also want to point out uh, with the flood insurance, there's been a lot of changes with FEMA. And um, there's been some mapping, rezone, there's some rezoning with the mapping and, and things. So, um, 
some of you that are familiar with the industry know, but um, for a lot of us, maybe we're not aware. And so there's a lot of things that go into getting flood insurance now. So really, if, you are, if, you're, if your property is in a special flood hazard zone, okay, let me back up. Every property on the island is in a flood zone, okay? If you're in a special flood hazard zone, then if you have a mortgage, your lender will require you to have flood insurance. Yeah, and special, that's the 100 year zone. We'll talk about that. It's like the B or A zone if you look it up on your flood map. Okay, good. What is it? He's an X. Oh, okay. So as long as you're in X, you're okay. Um, but, okay, so that's the flood insurance. So um, replacement costs versus market value of property. Okay, so, so with insurance, um, we don't care about market value. Your, your real estate agent, you know, your bank, they care about market value. That's you, typically like your land value and, and your house value in comparison to what's selling in the neighborhood in the market. Uh, replacement cost is what we care about. That's what it would cost to rebuild your house in a total loss situation. Okay, yeah. And um, I think the, 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 the point we're getting across with this is you should look at your policy every year because the replacement value is going to change every year. There's going to be inflation, right? Your house making it today is going to be a lot different than when they made it 20 years ago, built it 20 years. There's going to be inflation, you're going to, the building codes are going to change, making it more expensive, maybe made improvements, maybe they had a patio, solar, that's all going to add to the value of your house. There could be surge demand, like when um, Kaua I think he hit Kauai, the there's a shortage of contractors, and the prices went up like 30%. So all of these things are, um, you should look at it. And I, I, you know, that's one thing I'm gonna be looking at very short, I should have actually done it before hurricane season. But I'm gonna be looking at my policy. So I have a State Farm policy. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at it, because I, I, I do plan to increase it to, for, to, to adjust for the different replacement value of the house. And then uh, there's a waiting period, and Rob mentioned, for some insurance companies, it could be two days, three days, or more. But for the flood insurance program, it's 30 days. So you cannot, there's a hurricane coming in, and you're worried about flooding. You cannot just get the, the insurance while the, while the storm's coming in. So I guess what Dennis is saying is review your policy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't understand the terminology, uh, maybe, you know, have your agent review it. Stacy. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, every insurance company has their own model or their own software or their own um, uh, estimated replacement cost tools that they'll use. And, and it's, it's not a public known information, but it could be, you know, for standard construction, $150 a square foot, you know, average construction, $200 a square foot, whatever the case is, it's not necessarily uh, an exact that you could figure it out that way, but based upon the characteristics of your house, the square footage, the age, the quality of construction, um, that's how we'll figure out, um, you know, what the estimate is. And so we want to get as close as possible to to what a contractor would cost or charge to rebuild your house in a total loss situation. Okay. Well, good. And if there are any other questions, um, feel free to contact Rob. Or uh, also, did, uh, you have uh, uh, Hawaii County. I, I think you have a floodplain uh, in your in your Hawaii County building department. Some a floodplain manager there who could answer questions about flood insurance, but if you have any questions about home or hurricane insurance, Rob's here. Any other questions right now? All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go over um, the last part is, what are you gonna do with your house, okay? Because, um, and uh, this is the homeowner's handbook, it's in the third edition. Very limited supply. It's gone through nine print runs, 75,000 copies. We, I have like five here, and I'm going to try and reserve them for people who have a single wall house 
Does anyone have a single wall house? Oh my gosh. Okay, but anyway, um, we'll give, we'll, um, th th there are some copies here, and also you could download it, and I have a, a little bookmark, pr a pr printed bookmark, which will show you how to, where to get the book, okay? So, and it covers these hazards, okay? I just want to mention one thing. So, here's a Niki hitting Kauai, okay? So, it's going 30 miles an hour forward. The sustained winds were 120 miles per hour. So, in the right front quadrant, the sustained winds and the forward motion add together, and it's 150 miles per hour. In the left front quadrant, they subtract. So it's 90 miles per hour. And the difference between a 90 mile per hour wind and a 150 mile per hour wind is huge. It's like, because the, the force on a building is not proportional to the wind speed, but the square of the wind speed. So if the, if this increase, the wind speed increases 30%, the, the force on the building will double, okay? So what happens here is um, you can see where the eye of Aniki went, and of course all the storm surge is being pushed because um, the, the winds are rotating clockwise around the eye. All the storm surge is being pushed along the coast on the right front quadrant, which is always the worst. So you got to watch that right front quadrant. Okay, and if you look at the buildings in Kauai, all, almost all the single wall buildings in this part, the larger percentage of them, did not survive. Also because they were older building code. And a lot of the ones that did survive are all on the left front quadrant of the, build, of, of the hurricane. So it's very important where the hurricane makes landfall. Okay, so uh, that's, Niki, we're gonna skip that. And this is uh, a cell, we're gonna skip that. You've already s heard about that. Um, oh, here's, here's almost like a, a, a really bad scenario for the state of Hawaii. It, when you get a hurricane like this, and two days, this was Anna, and two days before the, um, uh, this is two days out, and it looks like the right front quadrant is gonna, which is the most damaging part, it's gonna hit the Big Island, Maui, and Oahu, okay? So, um, it's very important for everyone to be prepared, no matter what island you're on, okay? And you've gone out, you've all, you've all seen these before, Brian showed you these. Now, if you see this, this is, the um, 2015 hurricane season. When I see this and the state here, I say, wow, this is, this is very dangerous and we're really lucky that nothing worse could have happened, okay? And then, that was in 2015. And then in 2016, Brian showed this also, the same thing is happening. There's these two systems and it's, it's really um, amazing that nothing worse happened with these two systems so close to the islands. See, that, that's 2015, 2016. And for both of those instances, uh, I did what I call a partial deployment in our, in our house. So I'm gonna show you what, that, what, we, what I mean by that, okay? Okay, we, we've gone over this. The only thing I wanna mention about the evacuation plan is it's not just enough to have, you know, say make a plan. You need a plan for a tsunami and you need a plan for a hurricane. For the tsunami, you're only gonna evacuate for the water. For the hurricane, you need to evacuate for the water or the wind, okay? <clears throat> we went over insurance and most part of this talk is gonna go over your house, what we could do for the house. Okay, we've gone over this. Arlena mentioned 14 day supply of water and food. Um, so family of four, they need 56 gallons of water. If you buy a case of water at Costco, that's gonna be five gallons. You're gonna need 10 cases of that. You may, and that seems like, <laughs> but there are a lot of things you could do. You could use garbage cans, bathtubs, and I personally have what's called a water bob that you get at Amazon and you fill it up, uh, you put it in your bathtub as a liner and it holds 100 gallons. Okay. One of the things I do for my stuff is I mark, the expiration dates are so small, you tend to, you always miss it and then it expires. So I always get things with a long shelf life, I mark it with a big Sharpie, the month and year it's gonna expire, 
and I, uh, I only buy food that I'm going to use, because if you don't buy food you're not going to use, it's, it's going to expire eventually. Okay? And I'm going to skip all this. Evacuation plan. Okay. So for an evacuation, okay, you need to look at your Hawaii County Civil Defense evacuation maps. And when there's a, uh, a you, you should already know where you're going to go, but when there's a warning, you're supposed to get out of that evacuation zone. That's for a tsunami. For a hurricane, you're supposed to look at your FEMA flood maps. If you're in an A or V zone, or in a da dam failure inundation zone, you need to evacuate, okay? To look at that, you just go to the, you just Google DLNR flood hazard assessment, and it'll get you to this one tool, you put your address in, it'll give you your flood zone, V or A, and if you're in a dam failure inundation zone, okay? So if you're in that scenario, you're supposed to evacuate, okay? Even if you're outside of that area, you may need to evacuate for uh, if you have a weak structure, okay? So we're gonna cover what's a weak structure. The general rule of thumb, and I know uh, you mentioned 86. Okay. No, okay. I think it's 894 though, we'll, we'll check on that. Okay, okay. Um, but anyway, the, the, the concept is um, um, this 94 is when they uh, required a continuous load path for houses on Hawaii County. So we'll cover what that is. Okay, so here's the damage that occurred from, um, from Aniki on Kauai. Six or 7,000 houses damaged or destroyed, and FEMA did a building performance assessment to determine what buildings perform well and why. Okay, so one is they had what's called a continuous load path. So we're gonna discuss, and it's in the book, what a continuous load transfer path is, okay? And then the second thing which caused, which contributed to failure or success um, was if there was, um, uh, if there was breakage of windows, sliding glass doors, and hinge doors, okay? Essentially, a breach of the building envelope, because your house is supposed to not let anything in, okay? You want to make it like a fortress, okay? So here's what a continuous load transfer path is. It's almost like you're throwing a chain over the roof of your house, you're tying it down on each side, but instead of it external, it's all internal through the building codes, okay? And so the, um, the weakest part is right here, this roof-to-wall connection, and that's why they have the hurricane clip, okay? And then, uh, so this clip ties the roof to the wall, then there's a strap that ties the, the second floor to the first floor, and then there's some other connectors from the, from the wall to the foundation. So it's almost like there's a chain over the roof of your house holding it down, but it's all internal, you can't see it, it's all in the building codes, okay? But even though, you, your house may have not been built with that building cone, it doesn't have that, you could still retrofit it to, to add it, and that's what we cover in the book. So here's an example of a, a structure that's retrofitted to create a continuous slow transfer path. There's hurricane clips that are added externally, usually they're internal when they build it, but it's external, and then they tie this beam to this column and the column to the foundation, okay? So, there's different vintages of houses on each island. So uh, generally the weakest are the ones with no hurricane clips, no continuous load path, no window coverings. And then I think in 94, okay, and we'll, I'll check on these the states, okay, because we gotta check these dates. But uh, 94, they required hurricane clips. In, um, and in 94, actually Hawaii County changed their building code to require hurricane clips and the contingent load path all at one time in 1994. All the other islands did it in a two-step process, okay? And then um, for under the new building code, you're gonna require a continuous load transfer path and either a safe room or window protection, okay? So the bottom line is it's not this, 
you know, even if your house is built here, is here, uh, it's not possible to make it as strong as here, but you could still make it stronger. You could add hurricane clips, which is covered in the book. You could add, try and complete the load path. We're going to cover that. And then you could add uh, window protection. We're going to cover that. Right? Okay, so this is why you want hurricane clips, okay? Because a lot of roofs were just coming off. And what actually happened, too, it was almost like a two-step process where there was a breach of the building envelope, internal pressurization, and then the, the combination of external and internal pressure on the roof blew, blew it off, okay? So here are these different hurricane clips. This one was common in, in the 1990s. This one is commonly used for retrofits today, and it's easy to use. Um, here's the wall, here's the, um, here's the wall, here's the, the rafter. You're just tying the, the, uh, the rafter to the wall. It's easy to use. Uh, as long as this part here doesn't stick out. But when it sticks out, it's a more difficult installation. So what they did, here's that part that sticks out. So what they did is they created this other clip called the Hawaii Plantation Tie, and it ties the roof rafter to the wall. And because this part sticks out, it curves around so you could still make that connection. So between this H3 clip and this one, almost every single wall house in the state could be retrofitted with hurricane clips. And I think I saw around 10 or 15 people with single wall houses. They probably don't have hurricane clips unless you retrofitted, right? Okay. So here's an example of a house in central Oahu that's been retrofitted with hurricane clips, okay? Its material cost was around $300, took two Saturdays, okay? But if you hire a contractor, it may cost, you know, $2,000, okay? There's a step-by-step -step guide how to add this, okay? And again, this is what you're trying to prevent. Okay, okay. Uh, again, this is the concept. You're tying the top plate of the wall to the rafter, and these are all these different types of hurricane clips, okay? And something new that's coming online and we're investigating is what's called the structural screw, okay? So we purposely missed the rafter here, just to show the, relation, the relationship. But here's a hurricane clip. It's tying the rafter to the top plate of the wall, okay? And you could see that it, instead, if we put this structural screw and put it over here, it would do the same thing, okay? So we're investigating uh, this structural screw as a way to easily retrofit double wall houses where they that don't have hurricane clips or the hurricane clips are not properly installed, or they're uh, properly installed, but you could sort of like fortify it and make it even stronger. Any questions on that? Okay, Post and Pierre, who has this? The tofu blocks. Okay, this is, this is a very uh, weak situation because uh, what it usually is is this post sits on this termite pan and there's no connections. It's just sitting on there by friction or gravity, okay? So, um, and during an earthquake or during a hurricane, there's a chance that the house will shake and it'll come off the, the tofu block and you can see the type of damage, okay? So, there was a, a, a report um, on a Post and Pierre retrofit by uh, Gary Chalk and Ian Robertson, uh, uh, two structural engineers, and they put up some designs to uh, retrofit post and pier. And then there's this uh, professor in Hilo, Don Thomas. Is, who knows Don? Do you know Don? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so he, he's your boss? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, anyway, um, he put this program together to, uh, to actually, you just sit, fill in some simple parameters and it'll spit, spit out some diagrams, how do you retrofit a post and pier? So you, like you put what island you're on, and like Hawaii County is the most difficult because you're dealing not only with hurricane, but it's the strongest earthquake, um, uh, has the highest earthquake risk of all the islands. Uh, and you, you know, whether you're close or near the shoreline, um, one story, two stories, and. Bottom line is put all those parameters and it'll spit out these retrofit diagrams and how to retrofit your post and pier and strengthen it. But what I'm getting at is um, 
uh, in the fourth edition of the book, Homeowner's Handbook, which we're updating, um, there are all these new products that are going to make those post and pair retrofits easier, okay? So there's uh, these shorter hold downs that are tied the post to the concrete foundation, and then there's these knee brace stabilizers and um, these different, different types of anchor screws. And I'm not going to go over the step-by-step -step installation, but the bottom line is um, you're taking a, s okay, this just shows different posts that have been retrofitted, okay. And what, are what it is, you're taking a weak system like this and you're retrofitting it like this. And it's, we're, we're not going to, um, we're, we're going to try and make it as simple as possible for a homeowner to do. But that's, in terms of the three major retrofits for your home, Hurricane clips, window protection, post and pier. Probably the easiest is the hurricane clips. Second, window protection. This is probably the most, little more difficult, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Yes, sir. No, it just, the pier just sits on that termite pad. No, but the cement block itself is not anchored to the ground. No, that's right. In the structural, um, structural retrofit report, there's some even more complex things where you take this concrete foundation out and you replace it with another foundation, okay? So, but for most applications, I mean, this is better than doing nothing yet, okay? So anyway, this, this is just shows you what's possible, okay? So this is a single wall house, originally no hurricane clips, no uh, post and pier retrofit, and then now, essentially, with these retrofits, we added the hurricane clips and the retrofit, and then we essentially create a continuous load path for a single wall house, okay? Okay, now the other thing you need to take care of is uh, windborne debris and window protection. So there are a lot of myths out there. One, don't, um, masking tape will not work. Two, do not open your windows to try and equalize the pressure, okay? Um, and here's why, okay? So here, here you have a house and the press, wind pressure is just on the outside of the wall and it's uh, exerting pressure on the wall and the roof. But here you have an opening. It could be a, a breach in the window or a, a opening by design. And when this happens, there's internal pressurization, almost uplift, double the uplift pressure on your roof, more likely to come off. So a lot of times on Kauai, when the roofs were coming off, the first thing that happened, there was a breach of the envelope, and then the roof came off, okay? Okay, so that's why you want to try and protect your windows, okay? So in the book, there are 12 different options we cover. Plywood is the, probably the most readily available and cheapest, but it's the heaviest and most oh, difficult to install, but it gets still, it's still possible, and we cover how to do that. Um, the easy, when you do fasteners for plywood, it, it needs to go in the structural framing of the window. Okay, and what I usually do for plywood or for any panel system, I have there are these storm panel screws. What I do is I put one on the top left, one on the top right corner, cover it with this white plastic cap, and when there's an incoming event, just pull the cap off, the panel's already prepared, just put the panel on, fasten it with wing nuts, two wing nuts and one screw, and it's already installed. I could do it in five minutes, okay? But it's all got to be prepared beforehand. You cannot be cutting plywood uh, when there's a watch or a warning, okay? So well, I'm going to skip this. And this is what we call the partial deployment. When there was all these systems, Anna coming through, 2015, uh, there was those 15 systems, 2016 with Lester and Madeline. Uh, we did a partial deployment, only like one-third or one-fifth of the fasteners were in place, but it held everything in place, and if the system strengthened, I could just add more fasteners. If it weakened, i just take it out. Okay. okay, so there are other systems in place, though. So the book covers roll-down shutters. This is what the National Weather Service in Honolulu uses. This is very good for single-wall houses. What would we probably recommend for single-wall houses that have a louver system, okay? This is hurricane panels. They're clear plastic, and they're corrugated for strength. And um, because there's a ledge built above and below the window, you know, they're easy to deploy, and um, they're lightweight, okay? 
Uh, hurricane fabric is pretty good. It works similar to like uh, netting, catching golf balls at a driving range. And this is um, uh, what we recommend for large, unusually shaped windows. Oh, another thing. There's another thing called storm stoppers. It flies like plywood. It's much lighter and it attaches with these industrial strength fasteners. Okay, the fasteners go on the framing of the window and it looks it looks kind of ugly, but it doesn't because what you do is there's a white trim that goes on top of that. So when there's an event, uh, most of the times the white trim is on there. When there's an event, you just pull the trim off and put the panel on. Okay. So if you have inf if you like information on that, I could get you that. So bottom line, there's 12 different ways to cover your windows. The most expensive is plywood, say for a 15. Windows for a house, it may cost like $600 and roll downs up like $9,000 and everything in between is like things like here are two or $3,000, okay? And the trade-off is time to deploy, okay? Trees, we covered that. You got to take care of your trees. I know you're already addressing that, so I'm not going to go over it. Clear your yards, clear your gutters, okay? There's always junk in your gutter. I, we, and we just cleared our gutter two weeks ago but this is what it looked like, okay? Okay, uh, uh, this is a gable wall house, okay? And uh, those are where the, there's a, um, two sloping s sides meet in the middle ridge. And a lot of times if there's strong wind, the, the, the different roof components could topple over. So it's possible to fortify it with cr uh, cross bracing, two by four cross bracing. Okay, and then the last thing I just want to cover, actually two th things. Roofing, remember, wind pressure on a roof is not equal everywhere. It's always greatest at the corners and ridges, okay? So here's Capoho after a cell. You can see all the damage is initiated at the corner and, and the edges, okay? So when you re-roof, when you put in your solar, when you do anything with your roof, plan for this. Like if you're gonna put in solar, try and put it in that white area. And if you're gonna re-roof, fortify these areas um, that are near the corners and edges. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over this for lack of time. Okay, solar, if you're gonna put solar in, you gotta make sure the lag bolts hit the structural framing of your, your roof, okay? Uh, a lot of times the, the lag bolts will miss it and you gotta climb, sometimes you gotta climb in the roof and say, oh, you missed this and they'll, they'll co co go by and replace it, okay? Last thing, shelter in place, okay. Okay, your house, how, can, how well could you shelter in place? Think of it like uh, the story with the three pigs or whatever is, um, you know, a house made of straw, wood, and stone. Same thing, single wall house, double wall house, stone house, okay. Um, generally, we put, we're just about to release this diagram, so, um, if you're a single wall house, for instance, okay, and it's in poor condition, it's generally not a good idea to, to shelter in there. But it's, it'll be stronger if it's in good condition. Always, you know, keep your house in good condition. It'll make it stronger. Make sure it doesn't have termite damage. Make sure it doesn't have wood rot, okay? Okay, you could add hurricane clips. You could add window protection and even the foundation upgrades. All of those are in the book, and you could almost increase the strength of the single wall house from poor to good, you know, being able to shelter in place. This is assuming, though, you've got to be outside of a flood zone, right? Remember the flood or dam inundation zone? Okay. And, and if, um, now, and this is like for a weaker hurricane, but as you go to stronger and stronger systems, you know, it's, you may have to uh, go to a double wall house or, it's, or a house with concrete walls, okay? And the bottom line is, um, I think for the houses on Hawaii County, the ones with a complete load path, those are the ones built after 94. Um, you know, if you're questioned about where to go to, and you're not quite sure how strong your house is, again, go to your friend's or relative's house that was built in 94 after. Okay, so that's all I'm going to cover today. Yeah. Thank you. thank you so much, Dennis. And I want to thank all of our other presenters as well. We've got... Barry Perriott from your Hawaii County Civil Defense. We've got Debbie and Tom from Hawaii 
Red Cross, and Brian went somewhere. Brian Hong from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's the National Weather Service. And you've also got a very big thank you to um, Representative Mark Nakashima for sponsoring this event, and also Representative Todd in the back. And our representatives from State Farm for coming all this way. Thank you so much. Do I get to talk about Secret? Yay! Um, this event is um, coordinated partially by University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, and I get excited because that's who I work for. Uh, we're a member of 32 Sea Grant College programs across the nation, and what we get to do in our communities that we live in and we work in, we get to address coastal issues. So natural resources, natural hazards, preparedness, all the way down to aquaponics, aquaculture, and food security, so, and rainwater catchment. So I get excited about that because we're, as extension on these islands and across the nation, we're able to be responsive to the needs of the communities and bring up projects and programs that meet the needs of where we live and work. So, love Sea Grant. And thank you so much for coming. Drive safe.